Well, good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. We, we, we love all you moms, and we appreciate you very much. And we're glad that you have a day that's dedicated to you. But today, we're here to do one thing, and that's give praise to a Savior who loves us. So let's stand to our feet. Let's lift our voices and worship this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. We appreciate you, value you guys. Actually, I wanted to let you know that ladies, on your way out today, there is going to be uh, some people handing out some gift bags for you. Make sure you grab that. Men, it's not for you. And I will say this, you don't want it. Just, I'm just saying. There's nothing, you know, candy in there. It's just you won't want it, all right? So don't even try and get it anyway. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Hope you guys have an awesome day. It's good having you guys with us, and we're excited to be with you this morning. We're going to put our eyes on Jesus today. It is Mother's Day, but listen, 
hey, to tell you this, ladies, it's really about Jesus today, right? Um, and we're going to honor him. And I love what Jesus tells us that gives us, I think, probably the most confidence we could ever have in just one verse. Where it says in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And every time I read that, I realize when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that means I'm not the way. I'm not the way, I'm not the truth, I'm not the life. It's only through Jesus. You're not the way, you're not the truth, you're not the life. It's through Jesus. And we want to celebrate him today. We want to put our eyes on him and just celebrate how good and how faithful our God is. And if you'll just join me as we pray, uh, we'll get started. God, we love you. Excited to be here today. We're excited to uh, show our appreciation to moms today and uh, the great value that they have in our life and how they have steered us and shaped us into the people we are. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for godly moms. Lord, at the same time, we want to honor you today. We want to lift up your name. And um, God, as we sing these songs, I pray that they would not just be words that we read on a screen, but God, they would have deep meaning to us. And they'd be a reflection, God, of what we really believe about you and how we really want to surrender to you. So all the things we do today, God, may it be about you and your fame. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's sing of this blessed assurance that he is. Blessed assurance and Jesus is mine and He's been my fourth man in the fire Time after time Born of His Spirit and Washed in His blood Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior. Yeah. 
trust Him. That's why I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior. chorus this morning that we trust in God because he's good and because even though we're unworthy he loves us let's just lift our voices this morning that I trust in God and I trust in God my Savior the one who will never trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
stir in our hearts a new desire that we would make room for him. We would shake up the ground. We would have a renewed focus on his will for our life. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. So this is the time of the service where we're going to talk a little bit about what Jesus did for all of us. But have you ever thought about what went through his mind? I mean, remember, he was human as well, right? So he had the pain of the nails, the crown of thorns, the whole ordeal, carrying the cross, everything that happened to him had to happen, and he had to have that going through his mind, the pain and the agony that he was going through while he was on that cross. But what was he thinking about? We're not going to really know. Right? We're not really going to know what he was thinking about, but we can take a gander and a guess. We know that pain was going through. And then you come up to a theological standpoint, and you look at it, and you say, well, he also had bore all the weight of all of our sin while he was on there. I don't know about you, when I get stressed out, my mind really starts to hurt and trying to figure everything out and just running around in a thousand different ways. So I can only imagine what he was going through at that point. I want to read something, because through all of this, the one thing he thought about was his mother. John 19, 25 through 27 says, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. Why would Jesus take a minute to do that? Why would, why would that pop in his mind? With everything that was going on, he thought about his mother. And I think part of what he was doing was fulfilling the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. See, at this point, Mary would have been probably in her late 40s. She was a widow. She didn't have personal income. She needed to be taken care of. So he was making sure that his mother was going to be taken care of. He was making sure that she would be cared for. 
with everything that was going to happen shortly after. So we're going to pass, the ushers are going to be passing two cups. The bottom cup is a piece of bread that represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. The top cup has juice and it represents the blood that he shed for all of us. But maybe, just maybe, besides the spiritual things that we do in church, besides praying, besides giving, besides serving, maybe to be more like Jesus, we just need to honor our mothers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him to a cross to die for us. Thank you for his example that he gives us. Once again, in an hour of need, he gives the example of honoring our mothers. Father, we just love you so much. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy you pour upon us. And Lord, I just ask you to continue to bless all of us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Men, let me just tell you real quick, do a good job today, the ladies in your life. Um, I heard they've got some good deals on pizza and hot dogs at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> Take her somewhere nice, man. Like, seriously, like, that's the most expensive place you could go, right? If you fill up your tank, and it's an expensive dinner. Just saying. You can also take her to Bass Pro Shop or, like, that's a good spot. Anyway. Uh, just think, where, where should you do, do that? Anyway, moms, we hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, you are really special, and appreciate you guys so much. Um, some good things have been happening here at Lake Houston over the last couple of weeks. We've had like 10 people make decisions and be baptized in the last couple of weeks, and God's doing some good things in people's lives. I do want to mention, just real quick, as we get started this morning, um, uh, we haven't talked about this on the stage, but we... About, uh, I don't know, about a month and a half, maybe two months ago, we officially formulated uh, a, a, a team here, um, and I say that because these teams have been already operating, but we haven't had like a cohesive plan with all of this, and so we unfolded, uh, unveiled this idea of our care team about a couple months ago. Our care team uh, takes care of all things related to people and needs that people have, and all these different things within the church and within the community as well. And our care team is headed up by a man by the name of Doug McGannon. Here's a picture of Doug. I think we'll throw Doug up on the screen for you. Um, Doug and his family. Doug sometimes plays bass guitar for us. He um, uh, normally attends our 11 o'clock service. Um, Doug looks really studious in this picture. Right? I asked him to send me a picture, and he sends me this. I threatened him and said, if you don't send me a picture, I'm going to draw a picture of you. Uh, and so he sent me this. He looks way more dignified than any picture I have of myself ever. Anyway, Doug uh, oversees our care ministry uh, and our care team. And the care team is made up of four different ministries in the church. One of those ministries is kind of our first impressions ministry, guest services, which is run by Brian Palmer. Uh, Brian also does all of our student ministry stuff here at Lake Houston. We got a picture of Brian. We'll throw up on the screen for you as well. And um, and so Brian does all of our student ministry, but also our first impressions. That is everything from greeters out front to communion servers in here to um, donuts and coffee and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the really important thing, just our first impressions when people come on our campus, giving care to those people. Another one of those care team ministries is our Stevens ministry, uh, which is run and overseen by Luann Tomley. Uh, Luann is this wonderful lady. She comes and attends our 8 o'clock service. Stevens ministry is a ministry where we mentor with people who are walking through just some 
seasons of loss in their life. Maybe they lost a spouse. Maybe they have lost a job. Maybe they've had something difficult, and they just need some encouragement as we walk through life together, and we partner with them in that ministry. There's another ministry under our care team, and that is our hospital and prayer team. Uh, That is led by uh, Henry Sir. And Henry uh, actually normally attends this service. Uh, great man, love this team. And they work and they go to the hospitals and visit people, pray with people who are hurting and or maybe going into surgery and things like that. And then we have our mental health coaches team uh, that is led by Holly Heiler. And Holly does a, a wonderful job of training our mental health coaches. So we're talking about people that are walking through um, depression or discouragement or any mental health kind of crisis in their life. And I I want to share that with you today because you might see some of these people walking around and they have a lanyard on um, and uh, on the lanyard's got their name. And normally on each lanyard, there's like a a couple of pins on that lanyard that indicate like what team member they are, part of that care team. And here's the thing about that. If you see someone with one of those lanyards on and you're in need of anything, they're the people we want you to talk to. They're the people we need you to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I am whatever. I'm walking through a difficult season right now. I just lost my job, and I just, can I, I'm looking for someone to talk to. If that's you, tap them on the shoulder, right? If you don't know how to check your kids in to the kids' check-in, ask the question. If you don't know where the bathroom is, they'll answer that question too, right? Whatever it is you need, you need to tap on those people, wonderful people. That, that, that team is comprised of about 80 or 90 people in our church, Um, And so there's a lot of people that are serving in that community and in those teams. So wanted you to know about that so you could be aware of what that team is. And if you're interested in joining that team, uh, you can reach out to our office and we'll put you in contact with the right people there. So good stuff to know about. I think it's uh, a good thing to have that as well. I'm proud of them. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and do me a favor. Turn to the book of Ruth. If you don't know where the book of Ruth is, the book of Ruth is the eighth book of the Bible. So start in Genesis, all the way beginning, move forward to the eighth book, which is the book of Ruth. And we're going to see an awesome story today. It's one of those stories that you go, man, this is a wild story. So many things happen in this. And it's all about family stuff. So let me just ask you, when you think about family stuff and you're dealing with family things, I don't know what your family looks like, but do you have, maybe some of you are part of those families that you think they should do a documentary on. You belong to one of those families, or maybe you're one of those families that are like, we need to go on one of those TV shows, right? Dr. Phil should have us on to interview us, or maybe it's more like the Jerry Springer show, uh, if you remember those shows from back in the day. Um, Because everybody's got some odd things about your family. Everybody's got that. Everybody's got odd things with their family. Everybody has that one family member that's kind of the odd one, right? And normally we say it's the weird uncle, right? That's what we normally say. Like every family's got that weird uncle. And I was actually talking to someone this week about that. And while I was talking about that, I realized I'm an uncle. And then I started thinking, I wonder if my family says I'm that weird uncle. Like, I wonder, and I started getting a little self-conscious of that, and so I'm giving my family permission that if I am that guy, would you just warn me so I can know? Anyway, uh, so we're talking about family stuff today, and we're going to talk about a story that deals with a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. And anytime you mix in in in-laws there, there's some odd things that take place, right? There can be some odd things. So I read a story this week that I thought was hilarious. I thought it was really funny. I went home and told my wife she did not laugh nearly as much as I enjoyed the story, partly because I was trying to retell the story and I didn't tell it right, but I'm going to tell you the story because I think it's an awesome story. So maybe this would, uh, you would enjoy this. Here's the story I found this week about family dynamics and odd things. So this lady writes, so a lady writes in and she says, my husband and I, you got to pay attention, all right, because there's some interesting parts in this. My husband and I were dressed and ready to go out for a lovely evening for a dinner and theater. Having been broken into recently, we didn't want to give the appearance that we were gone, so we called for a cab and we left our car in the driveway. When our cab arrived, we walked out the front door and our rather tubby cat 
scooted between our legs and ran inside and then ran up the stairs. And because our cat likes to destroy the house, we didn't want to leave her unchaperoned, so my husband ran inside to retrieve the cat and put her back in the yard again. And because I didn't want the taxi driver to know that our house was going to be empty all night, I explained to him and actually lied to him and told him that my husband would be out in a moment because he was just going back inside to help my aging mother get into bed. A few minutes later, my husband came out, got in the cab. He was all sweaty and aggravated. And he said to, my, he said to the cab driver, to my horror, this is what the, the husband says, sorry it took so long, but that idiot ran up the stairs and was hiding under the bed. I had to poke her in the rear with a coat hanger to get her to come out from the bed. She tried to take off running, so I grabbed her by the neck and I wrapped her in a blanket so she wouldn't scratch me like she did the last time. I dragged her down the stairs and threw her in the backyard. She had better not poop on the sidewalk like she did last night. (laughs) See, that's funny. Like, I thought that was really funny. Anyway, hopefully that's not the story of your life. That's not how you treat your in-laws or your mother-in-law, for sure. So the Bible has a lot to say about family stuff. The Bible has a lot to say about uh, our life. And we're going to hopefully see ourselves maybe in this story a little today. The story that we're going to look at today in the book of Ruth actually takes place in the time we call the time of the judges. This is a period in Israel's history where there was no king yet, right? There, there hadn't been any kings yet in Israel. And it was a time of, really honestly, it was a time of a lot of chaos. Uh, there were really like no rules. Uh, the Bible says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so it was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of brokenness, a lot of sin, a lot of rebellion. And what happened was the, the nation of Israel kind of got in this kind of cyclic pattern where they would do wrong, they would act selfishly, they would do sin, and God, because of that, would allow other nations to come in, cause trouble, give oppression, uh, force them into labor, things like that. The people of Israel would cry out for help. God would send them a deliverer that we call a judge. So these judges that were given, people like Samson and Ehud and Gideon, right? Deborah, these are judges But it wasn't a judge like we understand a judge. It really literally meant a leader, someone who was going to deliver them out of this trouble that they were in. So that's kind of what was going on in this time period. And what happened is during this time period, we find a man by the name of Elimelech. Elimelech was a good man, obviously. Uh, He was a Jewish man, lived in and around Bethlehem. He was married to a woman named Naomi. They had two sons, Malon and Kilion, And about this time in the story, we read that there was a famine that took place in and around Bethlehem, which caused them to leave the community of Bethlehem because there was no food, there was no jobs, and they were having a hard time. So Elimelech moved his family over to a a nation called Moab, which is Moab's this area that um, was out east of Israel, out kind of in this desert area past the Dead Sea. And here's that there's good crops there. Here's that there's not a famine there, so they moved their whole community. Moab was previously and still kind of uh, a foreign nation, an enemy nation. There was a lot of friction there between the two nations. All that being said, they move over there, establish their life. Elimelech ends up dying. The two sons, Malon and Kilion, find Moabite women and marry them. One of the wives' name was Orpah, the other was Ruth. Shortly after they get married, both sons die as well. So now you have Naomi, a widowed woman living in a foreign country, an enemy country at that, and you have two now widowed sister or daughter-in-laws as well with not really any clear direction of where to go and how to make life happen. And in this story, that's where we pick up the story um, of Ruth and what this looked like for the rest of this story and what the, what the rest of the story unveils about their faith and about their life that they had surrendered to God. So in chapter 1, verse 6, we pick up the story, and it says, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, 
she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. So she heard that the famine had, had lifted, things were better, so she's going to go home. <coughs> Excuse me. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where they had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, <clears throat> to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and they said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her own people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or tell, or tell me to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. Now, there's a lot going on in this story. And I want to look at this from the lens of especially looking at the life of Ruth. One of the things we see from the story is that Ruth was a woman of great commitment. I don't really know what compelled her to want to stay with Naomi. Not sure. It right? doesn't tell us all the details there. doesn't tell us why exactly she chose to stay with uh, Naomi. But there was certainly some loyalty there. There was certainly this compulsion that I need to stay with her. And maybe some of it was just the fact that she recognized the plight of Naomi. She recognized Naomi lost her husband. She's lost both of her sons. She's in a foreign country. Maybe she just felt empathy for her and said, I can't leave her alone. What is she going to do? Or maybe there was something about her faith that was attractional. Maybe there was something about Naomi's love for God, her devotion to God, that compelled Ruth to say, I'll stay with you. And look how emphatic Ruth was. She says to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Because where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if de even death separates you and I. We look at the story of Ruth and there was this 100% all-in commitment. None of this over-the-shoulder looking back kind of stuff, right? There was none of this like, oh, man, I, I, man I, I'd really like to go home. I'd like to go back to what's comfortable. I'd like to go back to my old family. I'd like to go back to my old friends. I'd like to go back to what was normal for me. No, we don't see that, right? She says, don't, don't try and send me back. Don't try and convince me to leave. Don't even put that thought in my mind. I am, I'm closing this chapter of my life, and I am moving forward. Last week, we talked about this. We talked last week about the story of Elisha, who was called to be a prophet of God. And Elisha, first thing he does, he goes back and burns all of his plowing equipment. Why? So that he wouldn't have any temptation to run back to his old way of life. And Ruth is doing the same thing. She's saying, don't tempt me, Naomi. Don't put those thoughts in my mind. I'm committed fully to what you and where you're going to go. There's a, we used the illustration last week of Cortez, the explorer who was entering into Mexico and he decides to burn his ships on the shoreline there so that his men would not have any temptation to retreat. There's a song that is written by King and Country that goes like this. It says, step into a new day. We can rise up from the dust and walk. We can dance upon our heartaches. So light a match, leave the past, 
burn the ships, and don't look back. And I think about that. Like, that's, that's what Ruth did. Ruth said, I, I'm not going to have this. I'm not going to go back anymore. I'm not going to use that as a temptation. I'm moving forward with you. Why? Because Ruth trusted and believed in a better future for her. Even though she didn't even know what that future looked like fully. She didn't have all the answers, right? She didn't know for sure what was going to take place. She didn't even know what that future held. She didn't even know where she was going. She had never been to, to Jerusalem. She'd never been to Bethlehem. She'd never been over to Israel. And for her, I'm sure it was a little bit of this, I, I haven't figured it all out yet, but there's something about your God. There's something about this way of life, Naomi, that you have shown me that I want to commit to. And she was 100% committed. We also see that, that Ruth was a woman of great courage as well. I mean, put yourself in Ruth's shoes. She just got married, and shortly after being married, her husband dies. And now she's getting ready to tag along with her mother-in-law, right, back to this country that she doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know where her life is going to end up. She doesn't know anything about Israel and their way of life and how they operate. Will I be able to get a job? Will I be able to supply for our family? Will I be able to find another husband? Will the people of Israel even accept me because I'm from an enemy nation? Like all these different things that Ruth had to wrestle with. We see this great courage saying goodbye to her parents, saying goodbye to her family and all of her friends and everything that was comfortable. And Ruth's confidence was greater than any of the questions that came up. And I'm sure there was a lot of questions for her. What's going to happen? Where are we going to go? How are we going to provide? Who's going to protect us? And despite all that had gone wrong in her life so far, she chose to put her confidence in God. We also see that Ruth was a woman of character as well. You know, as a Christian, we put a lot of, we put a lot of stock in the idea that we need to have a faithfulness before God, an obedience before God, that the, the character of our life should be one that is consistent with the principles in the Scripture. We, we believe that. We believe that how we treat people and how we talk to people and our obedience and our actions and our behavior should model what the Scripture has told us. And we see the same thing in Ruth as well. We see growth and we see maturity in her life despite the environment that she was brought up in. Remember, she's, she was born and raised in a pagan culture, a, a culture that they did not embrace the ways of the Scripture, a, a culture where they worshipped all these false gods and had all these rebellious activities that they engaged in. That was the environment she grew up in, yet something inside of her was drawn to the principles of the Bible, even though she had not read the Bible, right? The New Testament stuff, that hadn't even happened yet. Yet she was living out these principles in the scripture. I think it's interesting. If you look at the story, and, and I would encourage you to take time to read the rest of the book of Ruth. We're going to look at some of it today. But if you read the rest of the book of Ruth, you'll see there are some attributes and characteristics about her life that you go, if you read it, you go, she's living out the ways of scripture. We call these things the, in the New Testament the one another passages. Um, where in the Bible it tells us, love one another, carry one another's burdens, be compassionate to one another, pray for one another, forgive one another. Here's the thing, if you read the rest of the book of Ruth, she's living out the one another passages before the other one another passages had ever been written. She's doing that already. She's living that out naturally in her life. We, we think about like scriptures like Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Forbearance, that's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We, we, we put those things up on like the wall and we go, that's what I want to be. I want to be loving and I want to be joyful. I want to have peace. I want to be patient with people. The thing is, if you read the story of, Lou, or of, of Ruth, she was living that out despite the environment she came out of. I don't know what your past is like. I don't know what your background is like. I don't know what kind of home you were raised in, Right? We still have the opportunity, we still have the responsibility to look at the scripture and go, that's, that's the life I want. I want to model those characteristics in my life. So some lessons we learn from the story of Ruth here. One, I think it's worth noting that 
it's true that life is, life is hard. Right? Life is hard, but God is good. Life is hard. Loss is hard. You're going to have loss. Every one of us is going to have loss in our life. If we live our life for any amount of time, there is going to be great loss in your life. That might look like Naomi and Ruth's life. It might be the loss of loved ones. It might be the loss of a career. It might be the loss of possessions. It might be the loss of friendships and relationships. We're going to experience loss. Why? Because we live in a broken world. I would say we live in a world that is shattered because of sin. Because of our own rebellion against God's law and God's principles, we see this brokenness all around us. Naomi loses the home that she lived in because of the famine. She has to say goodbye to family and friends. She loses a husband, loses sons. Ruth loses a husband. Ruth has to leave and leave her home and leave what's comfortable. There's great loss in this story. But we shouldn't be surprised at that, right? That's what Jesus told us. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, In this world you will have trouble. But I want you to look at that verse. In this world you will have trouble. And it's interesting because in that verse, right, John 16, verse 33, says, in this world you will have trouble, but bookend on the ends of that verses, right? It says, you're going to have trouble in the middle, but at the beginning he says, I want you to know you can have peace because I've overcome the world. He's telling us, you're going to have trouble. It's it's a truth, it's a fact, we're going to have loss, we're going to have hardship, but God is good, God is faithful, he can deliver peace, he can deliver strength for us, and he certainly can heal us as well. We also see in this story that bitterness is a natural thing, right? Bitterness is natural, but God can heal those wounds. It's natural to be bitter when things go wrong. Naomi, the mother-in-law in this story, became bitter. She had lost her husband. She had lost her sons. And she became greatly bitter about this. And you, you kind of look at the story and you go, can you blame her? Can you blame her for being upset that it, all that has gone on? Actually, it tells us that when Ruth and Naomi get back to Bethlehem area, people came out to see them. And they're like, oh, it's Naomi. She's back. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says this. It says that Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara, because the Almighty has left my life bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. She says, don't don't call me Naomi. You call me Mara. The word Mara, the name Mara meant bitterness. She was hurt. She's upset. It's a natural thing to be upset. It's a natural thing to grieve. It's a natural thing to even, I think, vent and express our frustration God doesn't curse her for that, right? God works in this and begins to heal her. It's interesting, if you read the rest of the book of Ruth, at the end of the story, Ruth ends up marrying someone. We'll talk talk about that in a moment. She ends up marrying someone, has a child, and Naomi, by the end of the story, Naomi is praising God for all that he had done. I think another interesting note is that Naomi tells all of those people back in Bethlehem, hey, don't call me Naomi, you call me Mara because I'm bitter, but you know what everybody does? They call her Naomi. They don't, they don't indulge in this. They don't feed into the craziness. They continue to encourage who she really is in God. Another lesson we learn here is that hard work honors God, and I believe it pays dividends in our life as well. That we're called to hard work. Regardless of the situation, regardless of how difficult it is, we're called to hard work. It honors God. It tells us here that they move back to Bethlehem, and the first morning they're back in Bethlehem. Look what it says in chapter 2, verse 2. It says that Ruth tells Naomi, Naomi, or Ruth says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field that belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. You know what Ruth didn't do? 
Ruth didn't wallow in pity. She didn't hold up in her own room and, and wait for the government to come bail her out, right? She didn't say, hey, I'm waiting for my food stamps to get here. I'm waiting for my, uh, my I help to come along. No, she says, I'm going to go work. I'm going to go hard. I'm going to do this hard work. So she goes out into a field. Now, in ancient uh, cultures, and certainly in ancient Israel, God had provided a welfare system. He said to all the farmers, listen, when you harvest your field, don't harvest the whole thing. Leave the corners, leave a couple rows on the outside edges so that people who are less fortunate can come out and glean from your fields. It's God's way of taking care of us. It's God's way of taking care of people that were in difficult seasons. And so in this story, God provides for her. God allows her protection and great blessings that come out of this because of her hard work. Now, for the sake of time, we don't have time to read the rest of the story but let me give you a picture of what took place. The Bible tells us that they move back to Bethlehem. She goes, Ruth goes in and starts working in the fields, and God does some great things. Now, in a lot of cultures, there's different ways of doing things, right? We know in ancient Israel, there were different ways they did life. They had prearranged marriages, right? They had a dowry system where you would pay for these marriage type things. They had a sacrificial system that we don't, we don't live under that any longer, they also had a, a different situation where if a husband or if a wife loses a husband, often the, the next in line would marry the, the wife of, of her, the brother, and all that kind of stuff. There were some odd things that they did. So Naomi moves back, and she has land there that was in her family's name because they lived there before. But now she has no husband. Elimelech is gone. She has no way of paying for this land. She has no way of managing this land. And so she's got to figure out a way to do this. In ancient Israel, they had a system in, in place where the closest relative of that family member who died has the option and the opportunity and kind of the responsibility to go ahead and pay for the land of that person, right, that family, to bring them honor, to bring them uh, back into kind of a, a stable position. But what happened is in buying the land for that family, you also acquired all the assets as well. So you got the John Deere tractor and you got the guest house. You got all this stuff, but you also got any workers, but you also got those family members. It means that, she, that whoever buys this property for Naomi also gets Naomi, and they also get Ruth as well. Ruth begins to glean and harvest for their food out of a man's field named Boaz, who happens to be a family member of Elimelech, the man who died, the father-in-law who dies. There's a long story that goes with this. Boaz started protecting Ruth. Um, the Bible tells us that he noticed Ruth, which really means he had the hots for Ruth. That's really what that means, right? Uh, and he takes uh, an interest in Ruth. He protects her. But I tell you what, what, what first we see about Boaz is he sees Ruth. He sees and understands her struggle, and he protects her, right? He says, you just stay here. You, you don't go to anybody else's field. You stay here. I'll take care of you. And there begins this kind of, if you really read it, some really odd courtship kind of things that go on there. But by the end of the time, we see that Boaz wants to do the right thing to help this family. As a godly man, he, as a relative of Naomi's family, has an opportunity to do the right thing. And the long story of it is that Boaz agrees to purchase the land. And this is a thing that they call in ancient Israel a kinsman redeemer. Boaz, in the scripture here, was called the kinsman redeemer, or guardian redeemer. It means that the person who buys the land, right, is helping them out. It's a kinsman, it's a family member who is redeeming this situation. So it says that Boaz agrees to do this, and he does it in front of all these witnesses. In chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Then Boaz announced to the elders of the town and all the people, he says, Today you are all witnesses that I have bought from Naomi, all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the family, um, maintain the name of the dead man with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Verse 13 says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, 
And when he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Verse 16. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was a father of Jesse, the father of David. Boaz was named the kinsman redeemer. That term kinsman redeemer literally meant a relative who out of his own expenses pays off the debt of another. Naomi and Ruth, there's no way they could have done this. And Boaz says, I will pay off the debt on the property that you owe. I will purchase this property. And by doing so, I will relieve you of that debt. And so Naomi is rescued. Ruth has now been given a husband. She's adopted into a new family. And the thing about this is, and we've said this from day one in this series, that the stories that we find in the scripture, specifically the Old Testament, all the time period before Jesus, they're not just page fillers. The stories are not just there so it can entertain us and give us some kind of history lesson. But it's always pointing us forward to the work that God is doing. And here's the thing. The story here of Naomi and Ruth and their redemption, it's a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus. It's a picture of what Jesus would do. Boaz becomes the kinsman redeemer, pays off the debt of Naomi and Ruth, and Jesus has become our kinsman redeemer. He is the one who has paid off our debt. He is the one who has redeemed us. He is the one who has made our salvation possible. He paid the sin debt that we owed because of our rebellion. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship, that we might be relieved of our debt, that we might be set free from those shackles. So it's not just a story of Ruth and Boaz and this love story. It's a story of God's love story for us, that he wanted all along to redeem us, all along to bring us life eternally. One more thing is our final thought, and that is that God is in the business of using what looks like a nobody to do something that alters eternity. And I think this is such a cool thing. And we see this all through the scripture, that God takes who looks like a nobody, right, and does something so powerful that it changes the landscape of eternity. Ruth, right, here in this story, a Moabite woman uh, from, from an enemy country, an enemy nation, becomes Boaz's wife. She gives birth to a son named Obed, and then he gives birth to a son uh, named Jesse, who ends up being the father of King David and rewrites the story of all of history. Joy Burgess is an author, and she writes this, and I just want to read what she said. She says, Ruth's story is ordinary. Perhaps that's what makes it so compelling. She doesn't come from a famous family. She doesn't have great riches or great position. Ruth is just a widow. One from an enemy nation at that. Nothing is going in her favor, but she is brave, and her faith never wavers. And yet the life of a foreign widow who has nothing becomes so important that it is included in the Bible, and her name is recognized in the lineage of Jesus. I would encourage you, go to the book of Matthew sometime today. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 1 today and just read chapter 1. And at the end of chapter 1 in this lineage, you'll see that Jesus comes to the earth. But if you go back and start looking at who gave birth to who and all this kind of stuff, if you start at Jesus and you go back 28 generations, you'll see that there in the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is a woman by the name of Ruth, who became the great, great 28 times grandmother of Jesus Christ, who has changed eternity forever. Whose story are you changing? How is God going to use you to influence those people in your life? Maybe it's your own kid that you're going to influence. Maybe that today is the day that you say, you know what, I I'm going to get serious about my faith I'm going to get serious about my commitment to the Lord because God has positioned me to give care to my kids, to, to love my husband, 
to, to treat my wife with respect, to, to bless my neighbor? Who is it that God wants you to help shape their eternity? You might think you're a nobody, but God uses people like that every day. Let's pray. God, I thank you for speaking to us today through your word. I thank you, God, for revealing to us that regardless of our background, regardless of where we've come from, regardless of what we've done, God, you want to use us. You want to adopt us into your family. You've got a purpose and a calling on our life. And God, I pray that we would just be like Ruth and we'd have courage to step out. We make these commitments, God, to you and the values that you have in your word. God, that we might maybe just alter someone's eternity as well. Lord, thank you for inviting us into that special place in your family. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand this morning? Hope you guys have a wonderful day today. Moms, don't forget to get your gifts on the way out. Men, stay away. Can't bother them. They're not for you. Yours is next month, all right? Hey, you guys have a great day. Let's sing and worship as we close. Oh